So, uh, you know, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a day here at Ascension if people weren't keeping it interesting, so we're having some tech issues, uh, so uh, uh, forgive us for that. Um, but our first uh, song is from the hymnal. You'll see the reference in the bulletin, LW203, um, so we're going to get that up and running as fast as we can, uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started, uh, so, so please bear with us there. Um, but we have our, our team of trusted musicians here going to lead us through the music, so... All right. Uh, well, welcome. Special welcome to any visitors who are with us this morning. Um, we're delighted to have you join us for worship. And uh, we uh, enjoy having children in the worship service here at Ascension. We encourage you to keep them here in the service as you are able. Uh, we understand God made them wiggly and noisy, and that's okay. However, we do have a nursery for your use available through the hallway to my left. Now, take a deep breath. Set the worries and anxieties of life aside. For you've come here not to do and to perform, but to receive the gracious gifts of God given for you in Jesus. 
So let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. One guideline consistently commended to hikers is the importance of bringing along sufficient water for the journey. It is important to be refreshed and revitalized along the way, wherever our paths may take us. As we gather for worship, our gracious God refreshes us here in this place where, as American hymnist Christopher Wadsworth beautifully phrased it, gospel light is glowing with pure and radiant beams and living water flowing with soul-refreshing streams. As we join in worship, our cups run over with that living water. Once again, we are renewed and satisfied and made ready to journey further in the name of the Lord. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. A time of silence for private confession in your hearts to God. Almighty God, we know and admit that we are sinners. We are conceived and born sinful, and we add on to that burden of sin throughout our lives by our heedless thoughts, careless words, and loveless deeds. Indeed, we deserve God's punishment now and eternally. When we reflect honestly on our lives, we readily see that we need repentance and renewal that can only come through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us then make confession to our gracious God. Almighty God, we repent of our sins in thought and in word and in deed. You know too well our failings and our transgressions. Be merciful to us, and for the sake of Jesus, grant us your forgiveness, so that as your redeemed people, we may find rest in you, and with refreshed hearts, serve you in time and in eternity. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At this time, I invite you to turn to those around you and share the peace of Christ with them. And the peace of the Lord with you. Happy birthday to you.
The Old Testament reading is from the book of Exodus. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from the fifth chapter of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. We read together. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, 
You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Congregation, please be seated. At this time, I invite the children forward for a children's message. Take one of these. Here you go. You take one and pass it around. Well, good morning. The Lord be with you. Thank you. So there's something that we're talking about. We talked about it last week. We talked about it on Wednesday, and we're talking about it again today. It must be fairly important. You guys been paying attention? What are we talking about? Living water today. And we talked about last week, we talked about being born again through water and the Spirit, right? So water has been kind of an emphasis today. So I brought some water with me. It's a water bottle, right? Does that look like water in there to you? Yeah. Yeah, it's water. What do you use water for? Drinking, right? That's the primary use, right? When do you drink it? When you're thirsty. When you're thirsty, right? Well, you said another one? Bathing. Bathing, right? We wash ourselves. We wash other things with water, right? But let me ask you, if you drink this, is this going to be enough water to last you for the rest of your life? No. No? Why not? It's small. It's tiny. It's small, right? This is how many? This is 10 ounces of water. This won't even get you through one-sixth of a day. You know how many ounces of water you're recommended to drink a day as an adult human being? 64 ounces. You got it. My wife was trying to drink more water, and so she got a bottle that big for work. 64 ounces of water. And if you look out there, I bet you not many of the people do that every day. That's a lot of water. Well, what about we get some other, we drink some other things. Maybe they'll help us, right? What is this one? Gatorade. We got some Gatorade powder mix right here, right? And what does it say on Gatorade? It's, it's called a thirst quencher, Right? So if I drink Gatorade, let's say I put Gatorade mix in here and make this into Gatorade, will I have to drink more or will I be good to go? I'll have to drink more, but it says it's a thirst quencher. Hmm. All right, well, last, our last hope, soda. Okay. If you drink soda, are you gonna, is this good for the rest of your life? No. No? Not even soda, huh? Oh, Simon, you think you know where I'm going, huh? Only living water? Well, what is that living water, you think? You know? Well, that's what Jesus says. He says if, if we get the water that he wants to give us, we won't have to drink water ever again. We won't be thirsty ever again. Now, of course, is he talking about this kind of water? No. No, he's not. What is he talking about? What do you think? His blood. His blood? Close talking about baptism. You guys may have noticed that I put the baptismal font in the narthex today, and that was a reminder of where we received this living water. You see, in your baptism, the pastor took water and he put it on your head, and you received this living water, but it wasn't just the water. There was something else there, God's Word. So when a pastor puts the water on your head, does he say something? What does he say? You remember? Yeah, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father, and I get another big bunch of water, the Son, 
the Holy Spirit, right? That's where you and everybody out there received the living water, right? Now, did you have to get baptized again? Not yet, right? What do you think? Have you been bad enough yet, Simon? You think you got to go, go for another dunk? No. No? Well, you're right, because in baptism, we're not making a promise to God. He's making a promise to us. And that's what Jesus is telling this woman today in our gospel reading. So we're going to say a prayer. We're going to thank God for giving us living water through Jesus. So, dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to give us living water. Help us to remember our baptism so that we can always trust in the eternal life that you have given us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, in Jesus' day, although Jews generally avoided Samaria, Jesus did not. Although Jews generally did not associate with Samaritans, Jesus did. Although Jews generally gave people from Samaria nothing, not even the time of day, Jesus gave them the most precious gift of all, eternal life. What a scandal. Jesus making friends with a Samaritan and a woman at that, two things that were definitely looked down upon by the good religious menfolk of Jesus' day. A rabbi hardly would ever be seen talking to a woman one-on-one, -on -one, much less a Samaritan woman. But we'd expect no less from Jesus. He is not captive to the prejudices of his day. But the scandal in this interaction is deeper yet. 
Because the Samaritan woman is a sinner. In fact, she's living in sin as Jesus speaks with her. And Jesus still gives her the gift of eternal life. Now, that's a scandal that even we can appreciate. So, one thing this episode in Jesus' life reinforces is that Jesus came for sinners. However, a common misperception is that people believe that the church is for the good people. A lot of people don't go to church because they believe that they have the impression that you have to be good, that you have to have your life put together and in order before you go to church and its services. The real scandal of Jesus is that He opens up the kingdom of God for sinners, like this Samaritan woman and her relatives, and for people like you and me. Jesus invited her to join in worship and receive this new life of forgiveness and eternal life. He invites you this morning to do the same. Yes, Jesus desires to have you and all sinners in the company of His people. But let's take a look back through the gospel reading to really parse out how this goes. So the story begins with Jesus taking a trip from Judea to Galilee. And ordinarily, because the Jews and the Samaritans have a hatred for one another, Jews would not take the route that Jesus does. To get to Galilee, Jesus takes the shortest route, which takes Him straight through Samaria. That was unusual. Normally, they would intentionally go out of their way and add quite a length to their journey to avoid going to Samaria. But not Jesus, because He cares about the Samaritans like He does all people. And when Jesus arrives at Jacob's well, He's tired and thirsty, the text tells us, and as He sits resting, this woman comes up to Him to draw water. And Jesus has nothing to draw with, so He asks her to draw water for Him. She's stunned. She's astonished. Not only is there a Jewish man sitting next to the well, but he's now asked her to draw water for him. Now, while it's true that he is thirsty, Jesus is really asking about the water so that he can have a conversation about something else, so that he can tell the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Well, naturally, what he says gets her attention. Living water sounds pretty great. But she doesn't quite get it at first, right? Her response is, well, sir, you don't have anything to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this living water you're talking about? So what does Jesus mean by living water? She can't figure it out. So Jesus says, well, everyone who drinks of this water, pointing to the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Whew, that is some gift. That sounds pretty great, doesn't it? So she says quite naturally, sir, give me some of this water so that I won't be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, take a moment to think about that. Even in our modern lives, where most of us, how many of you in the last week have had to hike to a spring or a well to get your water for the day? I didn't think so. But that still happens today, and in the ancient world, that was what you did. So can you imagine if somebody told you, hey, I've got some water, when you drink it, you're set. Not, for just, not even for just this life, but for the eternal life to come. How much time would that save you? How much effort and energy? You wouldn't have to go and draw the water from the well every day, multiple times a day, carry heavy jugs and jars of water. It's, so her response to Jesus is pretty, pretty natural. But what happens next after this interaction? We would probably expect Jesus to say something like this next. No, 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 you, you still don't understand what I mean. This gift of living water is not something you actually drink, it's something else. But Jesus doesn't say that. 
And as far as we know, he never again mentions living water to the woman. Instead, he changes the subject, or at least he seems to change the subject. He asks her to go and call her husband. And the conversation that follows reveals that she, in fact, has no husband at the moment. In fact, she was living with another man, and this after having five previous marriages. Now, why did Jesus ask her that question? Why did he tell her to go and fetch her husband? What is he trying to do by asking her to do that? Well, Jesus has uncovered the sin in her life. Sin that no doubt has caused her personal pain in a life of trouble and suffering. And we don't have enough information to know if that she, the sin is mostly about her, if she's the reason that all those marriages failed and that she's in the situation that she's in, or whether she's been abused by the men in her life and has found herself in a situation as the victim. But whatever the arrangement, her current situation is that she's living with a man that she's not married to. But we do know that she knew the effects of sin and her sinful condition. And she now knew that Jesus knows. And that Jesus knows her, the intimate, embarrassing details of her life, her withered, desperate life. Now, whenever I've had this thought, for whatever reason, that's come up into my head when when God displays that He knows the thoughts of your heart, I always had this image from like, I may have read it in an article or a book or something, of like having a, having a, like a little scrolling electronic screen on my forehead that was just constantly showing you all the things that were going on in my mind. Quickly it turns into a dream of horror. Can you imagine being fully known in that way? I don't think any of us are brave enough to put our thoughts totally on display, even from the last 24 hours, much less the course of our whole life. And yet, that is what happens to this woman. She becomes aware that she's standing in the presence of a man who's maybe more than a man and seems to know everything about her. He really knows her. Well, it's at this point that it begins to make sense why Jesus has abruptly changed the subject. You see, He had previously spoken of living water welling up to eternal life, and now He's identifying a great thirst in her own life, not a physical thirst, but a spiritual one. And that's because this gift that Jesus offers deals with people's sin. This living water doesn't quench a physical thirst but a spiritual one. The gift of living water Jesus is giving this woman is forgiveness and acceptance by God. By uncovering her sin, He is making her thirsty for this new life-giving water. Well, now the conversation turns to worship, the truth of worship. And still caught in the prejudices of her time, the woman asked Jesus about Jewish worship. And Jesus informs her that a new time has come that transcends the Old Testament forms of worship centered in the temple, and a time has come where it's going to be focused on the Messiah, the promised one, the one who is in fact offering her living water, the one who would go to the cross, die, and rise for her sins, the one who would give her eternal life. But let's apply this conversation to us now. You see, there's a scandal going on in this conversation. We can tell that from the historical context, but also from what Jesus is doing. There's a scandal going on in our worship today. Jesus is still coming to sinners with the gift of eternal life. And make no mistake, just like with the woman, He knows you. He really knows you as if there's a billboard on your forehead showing on display all the thoughts and deeds of your inner life and your past and your future. And yet still, He comes to you. In other words, sinners like the woman at the well are welcome in our Lord's house. 
Those kinds of people are invited to come and to drink and to eat at our Lord's table. People like you and me. People who don't think they're good enough to inherit eternal life. Welcome our sinners who's chased after other gods, the gods of money, of sex, of alcohol, of other religions, or just the self. Whatever it is, you name it. Jesus says to you, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, rest for your souls. So did Jesus have baptism in mind in his conversation at the well? It's likely, we don't know for sure, but it's likely because these are the words we read right before our gospel account today. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed for Galilee. And given the context of our conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus from last Sunday, he's combining the water baptism of John, and then it becomes being born again in water and the Spirit, and now those are combined together in living water. After those baptisms, it's when he came through Samaria and encountered the woman at the well. Well, I invite us to think of baptism today as well as we contemplate the living waters that Christ has come to bring. That's why I moved the baptismal font to the narthex, so you had to walk by it to come in. Because by it, you have been made the new creation that you are. By it you have been, by the grace of God, through the scandalous gift of Jesus, His beloved children, fellow heirs of eternal life. In fact, we already did this remembering at the beginning of our divine service, because together we remembered the name into which we were all baptized, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how we begin our gathering each Sunday, because it reminds us of why we can, in fact, even be here. Because Jesus came for sinners to bring them into His kingdom. And He demonstrates that to you by His many gifts in the service, but most pointedly in response to your confession of sin. As you don't need me to tell you that you're unworthy, that your life still consists of struggles with sin. We come and confess that together, and yet every time you confess that sin, whatever it is, no matter how many times it is that you're confessing that same sin, you hear the same thing. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this lady... After coming to accept the awesome acceptance of Jesus, she goes into her village to tell many others about the Messiah. She told other sinners about the one who offers this gift. And as a result of her witness, they went out to meet and talk with Jesus, and he stayed with them for two days. The result of those two days is they come to believe in him as the Messiah, the Christ of God. For they say, they turn to the woman and say, we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. What powerful words. Well, like her, you are free, free to tell others about the unconditional love of God in Christ Jesus. You may invite others to come and meet Jesus in the preaching of the cross and the empty tomb. They may think that this will be a scandal for them, for sinners for broken people, for people whose lives are a mess to come to church. But you can share that that's exactly who Jesus wants. You can share that He knows all my sins too. And even still, He loves me. Tell them of His life, His forgiveness, and trust the Spirit of God to work through you. They may resist at first, but don't give up. The Word is still working, just as it did at that well so long ago. Jesus is still coming for sinners to make them His children. So Jesus, just like Jesus didn't go around Samaria, 
that went straight through. He's come here to meet us, us sinners today. He hasn't avoided us, but come to us. And we pray together that God also grants us the opportunity to walk into the paths of others, to meet them and share this good news, that despite God knowing everything about you, the messy, the shameful, the intimate details of your life, God has come and He's promised a gift to you, a gift of the forgiveness of sins, the acceptance and love of God, and eternal life. So dear friends in Christ, as you leave the sanctuary today, one of the reasons I put the baptismal font out there is there's a way you can use it. You don't have to, but I encourage you to do it, even if you've never done it before, to remember your baptism, to remember this gift of living water that has been given to you in Jesus. And that is to take your three fingers, dip it in the water, and then make the sign of the cross. And you can say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, you will remember this gift that's being given to you. And one of the cool things is if you just, we do that in the service sometimes to remember our baptism. But with the water, it stays on your forehead for a little while and reminds you of the love of God in Christ Jesus given to a sinner like you to make you his own. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until He comes again to make everything new. Amen. Please stand. Having heard the Word of God, we now confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, <clears throat> he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. At this time, we'll gather our offering. Come all you who are thirsty, Come to the water, come to the water, come all you broken hearted, come to the Father, come to the Father, find your rest, find your freedom, here at the water. Here at the water, arms of grace, eyes of mercy, this is our Father, this is our Father. Please stand.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, you have brought us to dwell in your house and called us to worship you in spirit and truth. Receive our praise and hear our prayers that we would leave this place satisfied with your living water. We pray this for all members of our congregation, but today we pray especially for Janine, Diane, Steve, Amy, Rebecca, Amanda, David, Rachel, Martha, Kurt, Jackie, Michael, Janine, Isabel, Brian, Megan, Isaac, and Ella. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you led your ancient people by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Lead us through the wilderness of this world by the hand of faithful pastors, that we would be refreshed by the living water flowing from the stricken side of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you have made us righteous through Jesus Christ and made peace with us by his cross. Lead us to embrace our suffering in faith as they shape us in his image and prepare us to behold your glory in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you appointed your Son to suffer on our behalf, that we would rejoice in the hope of glory. Make all Christian fathers to stand in your grace, that they would live faithfully for the sake of their families and urge them always toward eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, bless the nations of the world, that both citizens and authorities would seek justice, peace, and the common good of all. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, help the sick and suffering, especially those who desire our prayers and those we name at this time. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Pray for my uh, co worker, the Ocean, and her family, to deal with um, some, some health issues with their, their children. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayer. For Angela Makia and uh, anybody struggling with mental illness, Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Surround them with your love in Christ and according to your gracious will, heal them. Comfort all those who mourn and fill their hearts with the certain hope of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, to you all hearts are open and all sins are known. Strengthen our hearts by your grace, that we who daily sin much would make confession boldly and then joyfully receive your precious word of absolution. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated for announcements. All right, as normal, you can turn to the announcement section in your bulletin. I believe it starts on page 
uh, 9. Um, for details on upcoming events, our family small group meets next Sunday at 5 o'clock here at the church. Our men's Bible study uh, meets on March 25th, and we have our next men's fellowship event scheduled for Max Allegheny's Tavern, uh, Max's Allegheny Tavern, uh, for lunch and fellowship Sunday the 26th following um, our congregational meeting, uh, which leads into my next thing. So our, we were going to be having a um, congregational meeting on the 19th for the choosing of the logo, but that's been shifted uh, so that one of the presenters wasn't going to be able to be there. Uh, that's shifted to the 26th, so it's two weeks from today instead of next week, um, so we'll be shifting things accordingly for that. Uh, so please come to that meeting. We'll be voting on the logo for the church. Um, we also have Lenten calendars available for you out in the narthex, so out on the table there. Um, you should see them where you picked up your bulletin. There's some Lenten calendars. Uh, you can follow along during the season of Lent, the remaining part of it. Uh, we also have our spring appeal. It's continuing on and will run through the end of March. Um, today is the last day that you can submit votes for the community tithe, um, and I believe there are, there's information back on the table in the narthex and a box there where you can submit your vote. So either do that in that way or email Amy Dyack, our stewardship chair, by the end of day today to submit your vote for our community tithe. And our total so far is $402. So um, let's up our game a little bit, I think. Um, okay. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, um, uh, well, before I get to Cooper, I'm going to make it stand there a little bit longer, sorry. Um, just as a reminder, we have our Lenten service schedule on the back of the bulletin that includes Holy Week as well, so please uh, keep that in, your, in the front of your mind. All right, now uh, we're going to come and have a stewardship testimony by uh, Cooper Blake. So if you want to come on up to the podium here. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, I was asked to offer a, a testimony about some of the service uh, that I've been able to, to provide here at the church. I tried to keep my notes short so I wouldn't talk endlessly. I'm sure everyone will appreciate that. So, um, yeah, so my family and I joined, uh, it was about nine years ago um, when, when we joined, we moved to the area. And, um, you know, at the time, our kids, three boys now, we only had two boys, and Gabriel was, uh, was a baby. So it was a very busy time. And I, I remember one thing we heard from our old church was, hey, there's a time to serve and there's a time to be served. And at the time when we came here, we were ready to be served for sure. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's hectic. And everyone knows, like, that's had young kids in service uh, just to make it here, you know, on time or within five minutes can be epic. Yeah, <laughs> and so first couple of years, you know, then we had uh, blessed with, with Simon as well, and um, so it, it was busy, and then um, at some point I was invited to help out with one of the Bible studies, um, which, uh, which I, was, I, was, I was happy to do. Um, I, I think that, you know, in terms some of the questions that, that the, the committee had was like, hey, what, what, what were some of the obstacles uh, to doing it? You know, sometimes the hardest thing is just saying yes right? Let's be honest. It's our own complacency. You know, we have to give up a little bit of time, right? Make a little time for preparation, make a little time to show up. Just showing up, you know, I think that's the hardest part of life. It's like just waking up, just showing up, you know, these are the hard, the hard things. And after that, you know, I think it gets easier. Um, so the other part is, you know, personally, I would say, like, I, I think the enemy likes to tell me, hey, I'm, I'm going to mess things up. It's going to be wrong. It's, you know, it's, it's not going to come out right. Um, if you're a perfectionist or something like that, you know, that, that's an obstacle. Um, but clearly, you know, when we push through, it's a messy process. But, you know, the, the fruit that comes out of it is, is, is great. Um, and also, I, I serve as, as an elder here at the congregation. And, um, you know, it's, it's the same kind of thing, right? It's, it's a real honor to be able to, to serve people here. And uh, there are so many great examples in this church, right? It's not, there's so many people that give so generously of their time to make everything, you know, here happen. So that makes it easier as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a privilege. And, you know, for me, I think the, the fruit of it is, is just, just leaning a little more on, on God's word and, and his strength. You know, when I think I can't do something, I don't want to do something. But, you know, you just say yes, you just, just go through the steps and, and God will be there with you. Um, and I certainly have felt that. Uh, there's, there's also the joy of being more engaged 
with our, our community, right, and our, our congregation. Um, it's always good. I love, especially in these Bible studies, people probably know I have a hard time staying quiet. So um, I, I really benefit from that spiritually and, and like to share that. Um, and, and it's also, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a sort of gratification and peace that only the Lord can give us when we're, and we're being an active member of the church, right? Remember the body of Christ, we're, we're all different parts, right? And maybe sometimes we're being kind of dragged along. Maybe we're, we're the foot that's dragging behind a little bit. Um, and, so, and maybe we need to be, you know, we need to be served at times. But then sometimes it's great to be able to, to step up and, and help, you know, build some of that muscle, uh, be some of that muscle for the church. So, yeah, and just to close out, I'd say... Um, I really think the hardest thing is just saying yes, so I'd encourage everyone to, you know, to, to think about that and pray about it. And uh, yeah, lots of, lots of great examples here to, to look up to. So thank you. Thanks, Cooper. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and I believe our stewardship uh, theme for the year is stewardship of time. Uh, so often when we talk stewardship, we're talking money. Uh, this year the focus is time, because um, that's also God's gift to you. And so uh, we encourage you to pray about that and, and take the words you just, you just heard to heart. I know I am. So, all right. Uh, let us rise and close out our service with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Go in peace and...